In the previous video, we talked about Hemholtz's theorem. Hemholtz's theorem says that any general vector field can be broken into a bit that has no divergence, but it does have a curl, and a bit that has no curl, but it does have a divergence. What we're going to do now is we're going to make an assertion of a corollary. If we know the divergence and the curl of our vector field, that is sufficient to determine what our total vector field is up to some constant. If we further constrain this to say that our vector field must vanish at infinity, then the constant must be zero. So knowing the divergence and knowing the curl is enough to give you what your vector field is. Some vector fields will have no divergence and some vector fields will have no curl. But we can always go backwards to figure out what our vector field is from our divergence or our curl. Our special classes of vector fields, the, the two, if we have a divergence field, stuff is flowing out or stuff is flowing in, what we have are sources and sinks. And these sources and sinks wind up being sources for divergence, but have no driver for circulation. Because they have no driver for circulation, these sources and sinks can only make things flow out or flow in. Now, the other type of vector fields that we've been talking about are the ones that are divergence-free everywhere. These are solenoidal fields, and these solenoidal fields wind up having some driver for circulation. Something is making the vector field spin around in some vector direction at a given point. And for those, we have no sources and no sinks, but we do have a driver for that circulation. Taking a look at Maxwell's equations, the divergence of E is equal to rho over epsilon naught. Now this is true in general, static or not. But we clearly see that our electric fields are the type of fields that have divergence. In the static case, and this is not true in general, if we have changing electric fields, this, this doesn't work. But in the static case, what we can say is that the curl of E is zero. This means that electric fields are entirely driven by the charge density. They are irrotational, the curl is zero, but that means that wherever we have charge, we have electric field flowing out from where that positive charge is or flowing in to where that negative charge is. This is our divergence. That's where our electric fields come from. But they can't actually drive an electric field around. So static charges or charges that are moving at a constant velocity, as it turns out, we'll talk about later, can't wind up generating any sort of rotation. Magnetic fields, on the other hand, are completely different. Magnetic fields have a zero divergence everywhere. And it turns out that this statement, often referred to as no magnetic monopoles, seems to be true all the time, except for one strange experiment, which we'll talk about some other time. But in general, for static or dynamic cases, the divergence of B is zero. This means that B is always a solenoidal field. And of course, a solenoid generates magnets, so that, that, that's a bit of a, a tip-off that the solenoidal field is the magnetic field. But in general, the curl of B will not be zero. Now, in the static case, and by static in the case of the magnetic field, what we mean is a steady flowing current. Not that the charge is stationary, but that the currents aren't changing with time. What we can say is that the curl of B is equal to mu naught j, where j is your, uh, your current density. So, nothing ever has a magnetic field coming out of it. Magnetic fields are always going around. So these solenoidal fields for our magnets have a circulation, and the driver for that circulation is the current density. But because there's no magnetic monopoles, there's no place for magnetic fields to come out or go in. The corollary to Helmholtz's theorem that stated if we know the divergence and we know the curl, and we know that our fields vanish at infinity, we can solve for what our fields are. 
means that if we know what our charge density is in the electrostatic situation, that's the only thing we need to generate our electric field. It is sufficient information. And in the magnetostatic case, all we need to know is our currents. And if we know what our currents are, we can figure out what, from that current density what our magnetic field is, because this is the only driver for our magnetic fields in the magnetostatic situation. Going the other direction, if we know our electric and magnetic fields, that is enough to tell us what our charge density is and what our current distribution is. Hemholtz corollary winds up meaning we can completely determine our electric and magnetic fields from our charge and current densities. This assertion means that electric fields can be written as the gradient of some scalar field. And we saw the proof of this, or not the proof, but we, we saw the assertion put forth in the previous video. This is part of Hemholtz's theorem. And then likewise, because the B is divergenceless, this means that we can write our magnetic field in terms of some magnetic vector potential. So here we have the scalar electric potential, known as the voltage, the electric potential, and here we have the magnetic vector potential, which sadly is not nearly as useful as V. So you've probably come across V before. You may not have come across A before, but I promise we will talk more about A over the course of the term. As a result of these statements, what we can say, and what this video has shown, is that the electric field is entirely determined by the charge density, and the charge density can be entirely determined by the electric field. The magnetic field can be entirely determined by the, surface, the, by the, the charge that's moving around, the, um, the current density, and the current density can entirely determine the magnetic field as long as we are in an electrostatic and in a magnetostatic case.